wonderful pianist with us, Angela Hewitt. Uh, you've been here before, actually. I have. Uh, this is the second time. Yes. Uh, and we'll never forget the first time, not only because of your amazing concerts, but also because you inaugurated our Steinway. Right. I did. It was yeah. four years ago, I guess. Yes, it was they, a while ago. So now. they say. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but this time, you're not playing the Steinway. We have no. a different piano for you. We One do. of your favorites, actually. The Fazioli. Uh, the Fazioli. So yeah. I'm interested in, in this because. Um, the, the tool the uh, musician uses often changes your relationship with the music. So I would imagine that the Fazioli would actually change your relationship with Bach in some, or help you to imagine uh -huh. Bach in a different kind of way. So maybe you can say something about what the Fazioli does, actually, to, sure. to your thinking about Bach. Of course. Well, I first started playing Fazioli, uh, I think, in night. Well, I, I first tried one in 1995 in, in Australia in a 3,000-seat hall in Sydney, the town hall, and I thought, wow, you know, this is some powerful piano. And then in London in 1999, I bought what, a small one, about well, a bit bigger than this, from my, my flat in London at home, and uh, started playing them also in concert. Uh, it wasn't until 2003 that I bought my first uh, concert grand, which is the piano I make all my records on now. So, but over the last 20 years that I've been working on Fazioli, I do find that my imagination for color and for touch has really developed because it gives you more possibilities. It, 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 it just, you can do more on it because of its flexibility. Uh, because of the wide range of sound, from very, very soft to really powerful. Uh, and it has this wonderful ring that, you know, even if you play really lightly and soft, it, it, it still has a ring. It doesn't sort of go flat, you know. And so um, I think you can hear, if you listen to, you know, I've recorded the Well Tempered Clavier, which I'm playing here twice. I recorded it in 97, 98 on a very beautiful Steinway in Germany. And then I recorded it 20 years later, 20 years later, yeah. No, 10 years, uh, no, yeah, 20 years later, 97. No, 10 years later, sorry, 10 <laughs> now is 20 years later, yeah. I recorded it 10 years later on uh, Fazioli. And if you listen to those two, you'll, I think you'll realize what the difference is, that there are just more minute differences in, in color and a bigger range and more flexibility. So it's a more, more nuanced kind yeah. of experience yeah. in terms of sound. Yeah, and I've just been playing the piano in the hall, and your hall, you have a great hall here, so it, it really rings and really sounds good. Now, it is a different sound, so if you're just expecting the sound that you're sort of used to from a piano, it might take a bit of adjusting. And some people, when they're playing it, their first, you know, they, they, they first, normally they go, wow, you know, this is something, but then they get a little scared because it takes a great deal of control. Oh, if you really want to play it to the, the play it as it as it can be played, so. So it's a little bit harder playing on the. In a way, I would say it is a little bit. It challenges you more. Right. I don't like right. to say it's harder, but it challenges you now, more. Now, somebody mentioned to me that actually the piano speaks to you in a particular yeah, way. That it, it, it does, does. challenge you. It makes you play. Yeah, and in the vibrations sort of you feel them. You know, you feel this life under your. But I mean, I've played all pianos. What is this? Kawhi, I've played Kawhi. I've played, I grew up playing Yamaha and you know, Steinway, of course. I still play a lot of concert. I played Busendorfer and everything. So I think that's important, you know. But at this stage of my life, I love the Fazioli, so I'm happy to share it with you here. Uh, Bach is an interesting composer because in many ways, he requires a lot of imagination, particularly if you're playing on the piano. Because yeah. um, usually uh, the, the instructions on the Bach score would be just, you know, prelude. Few. Yeah, <laughs> and there's, there's no nothing. tempo marking, nothing. no dynamic marking. No. So people have many different images of Bach. So uh, mm. in musicology, we have you know the, the very old stuffy Bach, you know this very objective structural Bach. Sometimes we have the very modern, enlightened Bach, yeah. the very lyrical Bach. I'm just wondering what kind of Bach you have. You know, what is the Angela Hewitt Bach? Oh, oh, well, it encompasses everything, really, everything from just the most wonderful musicality and, and the fact that his music is the basis of everything. You know, I mean, of course, his music came from what came before him. And actually, I learned a lot about Bach when I was studying Couperin and Rameau. It really helped understand, especially the French rhythms and the dances. So it's not that he came out of nowhere, but every composer after Bach was influenced by him. So there's this wonderful musicality. There's this... Um, uh, spiritual element because, of course, all his music was based on his, was an expression of his faith, of his belief in the eternal. So 
uh, there's this joy, there's this hope, which is largely expressed through dance rhythms. We'll show, I'll show you some of that later, um, how you can find them even in the well-tempered clavier. So these dance rhythms really express joy and this pulse, you know, of the human heart. Then there's the architecture, there's the, you know, the beauty of the melodies. There. There's, it's, you can appreciate it on so many different levels. But I also see him as a very human person. I mean, he had this brilliant mind to write all this stuff with, uh, with such a light, high level of inspiration and perfection in, in, the, in the writing and in the construction. But also very, very humid with a sense of hu humor and, 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 and genuine sadness and sorrow and, and the whole gamut of human emotion. And I, I think you really feel this when you hear the whole well-tempered clavier at once. Right, I, it, that really covers so many styles, yeah. and of course, your your thing about dance is, is very much an, an Angela Hewitt thing because I always feel that you, you make Bach dance because Bach is well, famous for not moving at it, the keyboard, yeah. um, but actually inside he's probably dancing. Well, he is, and the thing is, well, first of all, I was a dancer. I, I when I started the piano, age three, I also started classical ballet, age three, and so I did that for twenty years. So for me, music and dance always went together, and and you know, I'd put a record of the Brandenburg Concertos on at home, and I'd dance around the room to them so uh so I, I and and i would be playing bach concertos on the violin i also play violin and doing an arabesque at the same time you know so so for i couldn't i can't still separate the two but i mean it, it, it this music has to have that buoyancy it has to have that life in it and and bach was taught all the french dances like the gavotte the bourre the allemand when he went to school in Lunenburg, that was part of the curriculum when he was about 14, 15 years old. So in those days, it was you know something you had to know, and um, and so yeah, you know when I play in the Well Tempered Clavier alone, I know, the pieces of course are, are called Prelude and Fugue, but there's so many dances. There's the jig, the F major fugue, Book Two. <laughs> There's the Bure F minor. There's a minuet B flat. A gavotte. Those are fugues in the preludes. Also, we have even the C sharp minor, which is quite a serious piece in Book One. That's the rhythm of the lure, which we have in the fifth French suite. So, you know, it's not written there, but you have to know so much about these Baroque dances and their, recognize their characteristics so that you see them in these pieces. And, I'm also wondering whether there's a kind of, well, I don't know, Canadian Bach in a way, because, you know, you're from Canada, <laughs> and, uh, and you're famous for Bach because you won the Toronto International Bach competition. Sure, sure. And, of course, in Canada, you also have Glenn Gould, who yeah. is uh, Mr. Bach, right? Yeah, so, sure. um, well, I was just wondering whether you, how you relate to all that, particularly to Glenn Gould, who seems to be such a strong, you know, influence well, he on the Bach world. Was a strong a presence. I mean, when I was a little girl, like four or five, you know, he would be on television, black and white television, on Sunday nights. And I remember when I was really small, running into my parents' bedroom where the TV was, and, and seeing this guy playing with his hands up by his nose, you know, <laughs> saying, "Who's that kook? Yeah, who's that crazy guy?" Was Glenn Gould. And we, but we always bought his LPs, as well, which was what you bought in those days, and, and listen. But I realized even when I was a little kid that, you know, he was Gould and I, I was me, and Bach was, his idea of Bach was perhaps not what, what, uh, what I would see. His tempi were always very strange, you know. If, if it was a, a slow piece, he'd play it fast, and if it was a fast piece, he'd play it slow. So, so uh, not always, but a lot of the time. But uh, still, we'd listen, and uh, you know, he set a very, very high standard to sort of admire and emulate. And, but you couldn't copy him because you'd end up just looking like a ridiculous caricature of Glenn Gould. You know, my father actually was a much uh, bigger presence in Bach for me because he was a great organist. He was organist at the cathedral in Ottawa. He had come from England. Uh, as a young man, and he uh, played all the great organ works, you know, fabulously. 
a D minor toccata. <laughs> so I learned listening from him. <laughs> Those great organ fugue subjects gives me the shivers just to play them. And the strength they had and the drama and the excitement and what, how Bach would build up a fugue. All of these things I heard as a little girl listening to him play. So he taught me a lot about Bach, both, both my mother and father. My mother was a pianist. And so from the beginning, I was taught how to phrase, you know, not to play. <laughs> but, you know, all the high point in the line, the notes that are lighter, the one, two, three, you know. So all those things, I was very lucky that I learned when I was young. So you grew up with Bach. I did. And so it's in your blood, as it were. Yeah. And uh, I guess the pieces you'd be playing for these two concerts, I mean, some of those you must have been playing since you were two or something, well, right? Well, not I two, mean... no. <laughs> the Prague's and Fuse, actually, I think, my, well, my parents were wise in that, um, you know, there's, a, uh, as Bach actually stated himself, sort of, there's a very logical uh, progression that one should follow in his work. So the, the, the young child can start with some of the little preludes, um, you know, that, um, uh, the, well, yeah, uh, those pieces, there are a lot of other, you know, Anyway, they're little, sometimes only four line pieces, which are great. And, and the Anna Magdalena book, these, of course, before. And then the two part inventions, you know, <laughs> to learn how to play in, in two parts, in two voices. And then the three part inventions, which are, uh, you know, quite complicated. <laughs> And then your third part comes in the middle, so you get used to you know playing a third part with the inner fingers of each hand, and and then maybe some of the French suites, and then only the preludes and fugues, because if they come too soon, you don't you can't play in four voices until you can play in two and three voices, you know. So, but yes, the C sharp minor, this one, the number four, which you'll hear tomorrow, that I played when I was very young, the E major, book two, my father taught me that one, which I still love. It's great when I come to one that I played when I was young, because I remember it so well, much better than the ones I learned later in life, the C sharp major. But, um, yeah, but it wasn't un really until 97 that I completed the cycle. Right, but in a way you actually uh, were taught Bach as Bach would have taught his own children yeah. in many ways, actually. Yeah, His many children, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so you're now embarking on a very uh, big journey. I mean, you're in the middle of this Bach odyssey, really, right. where uh, you're going to play all the keyboard works yeah. of Bach in, what, four years? Four years. Four years. So you're in the middle of that right now? I'm, I'm past the halfway point. Okay, so yeah, I must feel it's good 12 to... recitals, and this is already, um, these are recitals six and seven, but um, so I've already, already done seven of the 12 recitals. Right. So the Old Temple Clavier, uh, the two books you're doing, uh, it's, it's quite a challenge, really, because, you know, I mean, I'm sure many of you have played some of these produce and fugues, I've played a few, but yeah. not many of you have played them all, and certainly no. not in a concert, because it's about four and a half four and hours, half of, hours music of music is a, is a lot. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering how you do this, because say you were playing the Goldberg variations, yeah. you know, Bach has structured the you know, variations for you, and it's, right. it, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't require you to sort of structure well, you still uh, have the structure, uh, but, it, it, but it's, it's, it's of a piece. Yes, that's it's one right. piece. Whereas yeah. this is like a compilation right. of uh, preludes and fugues, very yeah. systematically done. Yes. Um, Going up the scale, you know, from C, yes. all the keys. And so I'm just wondering, you know, it's, it's almost like a kind of flat surface in a way, and you've got to make sense of it, it in, could particularly in a, in a recital. So what... Yeah. I mean, how do you do this? How, how do you see these pieces in a, in a, in a recital? Yeah, I, you, I think you really only get a feel like that when you do play them all, uh, uh, the whole book, and, and play it in concert. Then you really understand why he put this one after that one. And one, one thing that's very important is uh, each key, because, of course, each key had its own characteristics. In fact, you can find on the Internet the tables of the broke time uh, explanations of each key. But, you know, C major is sort of just the universe. It's neutral. It's, you know, no flats or sharps. Book two. Mm -hmm. So... Um, 
Already C minor is more expressive. Oh uh, yeah. You know, da, 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 book two. Um, Now C sharp major, that's a shock, you know, from C minor, we go up to C sharp major, which was a key which, you know, nobody wrote in C sharp major really until Bach came along because of this system of tuning, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, later. But it was a very unusual key for then. So you can hear the light, you no, know, the color. This is dark, and then this is really... Mm -hmm, sorry. Mm -hmm. So when you're playing them, you have to bring out the keys, the characteristics of each key, and not like do like I heard once when I was on a jury years ago in the Bach competition in Leipzig, and and the the young pianist would finish like a Prelude and Fugue in C major, and without a break, you know, they go into one in F sharp minor, which is a totally different world, but playing it with the same color and with no breath in between, and that's when we would. Mark them down, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. <So> beware. <laughs> <laughs> beware. So, um, so that's one thing you have to keep in consideration. And then another thing is, yes, this overall form. I do feel, and when I was playing them, you know, 20 years ago for the first time, I think I read this somewhere, but I do feel it also, is that they sort of naturally fall into groups of four. So every fourth fugue, comes to some sort of good ending or conclusion. Um, you know, for instance, in the first four, we end with the big C sharp minor fugue, um, uh, which is a very spiritual piece. The subject, when you look at the notes on the, on the, on the stave, uh, they actually form the shape of a cross if you put it on its side. So it does have a lot of religious symbolism. Um, but it's it's a tremendous piece, and after after that, you need a little bit of space. That's where we let the latecomers in. <laughs> but I mean, you do. You need more than like three seconds before you start, which again is a different world. So so I do think of these groups of four, um, and then you have to think, of course, of, of larger groups. So say twelve and twelve, because there are twenty four in each book. No. Um, and what I find in book one is that, um, I mean, the first 12 are great, but then you get into the second 12, and the, emotion, the emotional um, intensity goes up a bit and goes all the way to the great B minor fugue, the last one, which uh, uses all 12, tone, 12 tones of the scale. So it's really our first 12th piece of 12-tone twelve, twelve music, no? Like Schoenberger. Um, anyway, he writes a massive six-page fugue on this subject, which he does write largo, one tempo indication in Bach, um, but very, very intense music you'll hear. So that's sort of really the culmination of book one, whereas in book two, um, which is longer, because the preludes are, are looking towards sonata form, um, to, towards you know the forms that would that his sons would use, CPE Bach and, and so on. Um, and the fugues are a little bit more complicated and dense on the, on the whole. Um, we have a very, very strong first half ending with this F minor fugue, that one. And then the second half of book two, I think is the hardest half of the 48 to understand, really difficult fugues, which you have to keep moving, I think. We talk about tempo in a minute, but oh, I can show some examples. Um, and I notice when I'm playing it that it really works up to the B flat minor fugue. <laughs> Again, quite a long piece uh, with all the fugal devices you can imagine. Um, piece of great strength. And then the B major and B minor sort of bring us back down to earth, uh, you know, and, and he ends with a dance. <laughs> Even though 
even though it's in the minor key, it dances. And so it's uh, light, more lighthearted than the first book, which you know has that big piece at the end. So that's sort of how I see it going along the way. And in terms of the tempo then, and you yeah. were talking about that, it becomes a critical issue then in the, in, the, yeah. in the second book particularly. In the second book particularly, because if you're playing one period in fugue, out separately and nobody's heard anything else around it, then you know, you're not so influenced by the contrast that you might have with another one. One fugue that is um, in that second half that's a good, uh, uh, good one to take to show you how, what different tempi people can take is the F sharp minor, this one, uh, which I play. <laughs> It's a triple fugue, so there are three subjects. The second subject is Actually, he doesn't write that trill in, but I add it. He just writes I think you really need the trill. It makes it harder when you have to do it every time. But uh, then, of course, he combines those two subjects to together. And then the third um, subject is this running notes here. towards the end he combines all three together so but a lot because it, it's quite difficult to play it at at that flowing tempo and to make the articulation very clear a lot of people play it. for me I'm already asleep by the end of the subject you know <laughs> Uh, and, and also, when you think of the, you know, this articulation just makes it so much more alive. And, as, and then when you get to here, you know, what do you do with this in a slow tempo? So when I started learning it, I started doing it slowly, and I thought, this isn't right at all, it doesn't. And, and so then I speeded it up, and it really, I just felt at home. Another one is the G-sharp minor, which a lot of people play. Again, I'm a, I, I can't, you know, for me, I have to be able to sort of breathe the subject. I have to be able to sing it and have enough breath to get through it. So that's why I play it. Which for me, it just is much easier to follow also. Right, and also, I mean, yeah. otherwise the concert would be like three hours. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> 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 really long. <laughs> that's right. So we're all very grateful okay, <laughs> for your good. tempi. That's good, that's good. <laughs> but it's interesting too, I mean, you're talking about key characteristics, and mm. I was thinking, you know, the first book, you, know, you couldn't be simpler, right, in C major no. when you begin. But by the time you get to the end, in the yeah. really, what would be a very ob obscure kind of key, or a bit more, yeah. kind of, uh, you get this very gnarled, kind of yeah, all yeah. the uh, chromatic notes uh, yeah. of, of that fugue subject. So in a way, even though it's a very, it's a well-tempered clavier, I mean, technically everything should sound the same as it were, you know, you could, um, but actually Bach individualizes every key. Oh yeah. And so the totally. whole thing totally. kind of still remains within that older uh, aesthetics of uh, the different characteristics there. Yeah. So I was just wondering whether you had any insight into what the different keys might mean and whether they, they, they also sort of parallel each other in, in the two books, you know? It's kind yeah, of the same do. kind of feeling. Yeah, well, I've talked about a few of them, but um, D major, for instance, is very festive. We have book two. <laughs> and trumpets, you know, trumpets and drums that come, come later in the piece. Uh, in book one, we have the fugue in D major. A bit the same mood. Um, we get a lot of D major in other, in other works, like the fourth partita again. G major, 
major is also very happy. Perhaps D major is more celebratory. You know, there's some some big something big going on. G major, uh, we have the book two since it's right here in front of me. A lot of joy in G major. Book one. And the whole Goldberg Variations is in G, you know? And this is a motive for joy, a rhythmic motive, which we have in A flat major here. The prelude from book, uh, book one, I guess it is. <laughs> yeah. So when you play a lot of Bach, you see these characteristics all the time in certain keys. Now, B-flat minor is very, very sorrowful. Again, a key that was very rarely used then, the fugue. Even in that interval there, you know, you've got a falling, falling fourth there, which is all, all already sorrowful. But this, that interval of the, the minor ninth, no? You know, there's such emotion in that. In reaching for it, no? So, uh, and then the interesting thing is that in book two, the prelude, again in the same mood, but here he takes the, this, and he puts it up in the top here as the counter subject. So that's really a link between the two books, no? Uh, so yeah, I could go on, but, but it's very evident that each key means something to him. So I was just thinking of advice you might give for people who are learning these pieces, because yeah. in a way, it's, it's strange because you're alternating between free music with the prelude and very strict yeah. uh, music with the fugues. Uh, and uh, I'm just trying to figure out, when I, do, do, should people sort of analyze these things very carefully, particularly fugues, you know, you just, you know or is it just too cerebral and you should really get no, to, you to have feeling to. this whole no, well, dance you have, thing? You, you, you know? need both. You need to analyze. You need to know what's going on. I mean, that's crucial, you know, you need to know the exposition, uh, you know, if it's a four voice fugue, a fugue, okay, there will be four entrances of the subject, you need to identify the counter subject, you need to choose a different articulation for each, and stick to it, write it in every time it comes. And then the episodes where, you know, where the subject doesn't appear, but he will use maybe some material from it, but that's usually passages of a bit of relief. So they can be lighter in dynamic if we're playing on the piano, no? Lighten up things a bit. Uh, yeah, we, we really have to do um, have to do an analysis. And then, you know, he didn't write anything in the score, but the, the clues are there when we know how to recognize them. Of course, it's easier said than done. Uh, but, um, for instance, when he doubles the subject, where is the B flat minor here? Oh, so many pages. Um, here. So he has the subject in sixth in the top, and, and in the bass, it's reversed, the subject is upside down in thirds. When he does that, it's sort of a clue that he wants it strong because you wouldn't be playing that weak, you know, because if he's doubling a subject, it really means something. He's emphasizing it. When you go from four voices to two voices, it usually means you can lighten things up because the texture becomes lighter. So when the subject comes in in the bass towards the end or not even towards the end, but if it's very deep in the bass and powerful, then it can really come out. We get that in the C sharp minor here. Oh, there are so many examples to show, but um, I love this entrance 
here. Um, that's the subject in the top. Second subject here. In the now wait for it. That's the pedal in the organ, so great to have it there. Um, yeah, I could show a million examples. No, it's of, great because you know, as a you know, as a music theorist and yeah. musicologist, I'm saying, yeah, you've got to really study this stuff. Yes, no, and, but you, you, do. you need to actually, and also having that context of dance, you know, knowing yeah. the period, uh, yeah. it really does bring so much more life to yes. a performance uh, of Bach. But of course, playing Bach on the piano also has the added. Uh, Difficulty, right? Yeah. Of distinguishing different lines because if you're oh, playing yeah. on a harpsichord or something, that that is a, is a different type of problem. It is. But on the piano, it's actually something that, well, I guess it's, it's a reimagination of Bach in, in many ways. Yeah, for uh, sure. So of course, this is what we do now. So I was just wondering also whether you had advice on contrapuntal playing because this is one of the hardest things I think well, uh, yeah. to get right. I'm going to show you two examples. Just looking for it here, uh, F minor, book one. Here we go. There's a passage I usually take. Which one is it? It's down here, I think. Uh, it's a four-voice fugue. So I'm going to play it in five different ways. Uh, first of all, I'm going to do it bringing out the top voice. So... Uh, going to do it bringing out the alto voice. Uh, hold on. Actually, I think it was this passage I used to do, but it doesn't matter. You should be able to do it with any passage. Now I'm going to bring out the tenor. the bass, which is the easy one, because it has the subject. <laughs> now I'm going to play it with the pa parts as I see it balanced out, so... <laughs> you have to have that level of separation in your playing. Now let me show you something else in the D major book two that's here. Sometimes it's hard to remember which is in book one and book two. Now this is four voices. I'm going to sing uh, the opening where, where the up until the third voice comes in. I'm going to sing, I'm going to play two parts and sing one. This I did practice earlier today. <laughs> That's tricky because the G is held, but the voice, the right voice comes over it. So So when you play it, you have to have that level of separation as well. It takes a great deal. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, in one sense, you're doing a lot of different things because you have to create different textures almost, yeah. right, for yeah. each. And at the, at the same time, you have to edit 
Uh, because you have to bring out the moments when things come in, yes. and then it has to sort of dovetail with other. I mean, you have to you have to work on it horizontally. You can't work on it vertically. When you when you learn it, and and you notice it when I play this subject, I lift after the fourth note. So every time I play that, in whatever voice, I have to do the lift there. Here in the bass. It's no good just to do it once or twice and then forget about it. So that's why you've got to take each line and turn it and write in these little gaps, which are never in the same place. So you've got to, you know, do a gap in the bottom half of your left hand while the other voices are smooth, for instance. So... And it's demanding music. It's, it's, you know, it's all brains, to, you know, a lot of it is games for the brain. So that's why yeah. when you're very tired, it's hard to play ball. <laughs> Not so relaxing, then. <laughs> no, but it, it's, it's fascinating uh, things, uh, stuff, stuff to play. I was also thinking uh, in terms, we talked a little bit about this, of deciding uh, on, well, the character of the piece and also the tempo of the piece yeah, tempo, yeah. and also the, the, the feel of the piece. I mean, how do, how do you do that, given right. that um, there's not a lot, lot, it seems that there isn't a lot to go on, because a Beethoven no. score will have like everything, kind of like telling yeah, you, sure. play like this, like this, like this, but sure. Bach is like. And even Sharon is much in marks if we want to believe them. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, no, in Bach we don't, but there are, there are two, um, two things that I think are crucial to tempo. One is, is this feeling for the dance, you know, um, that if, and if it's a jig, then it has, it should be with, you know, within a certain range of temp tempos, not too fast. You, sh you should be able to, even if you don't know the steps of the jig, you should be able to feel that it's, it's a speed that you could dance something at, that it's not too rushed, you know. Um, and then also how many harmonic changes there are in the bar. For instance, with the first prelude, we have one harmony per bar, no? Second. Third. Third. Back to the tonic. So we have it. These are the harmonic progressions. Anyone learning this piece should be able just to play it in chords. And then you hear the shape of the music and. the shape of that piece really now if you play this too slowly which a lot of people do in my opinion you know you're just about dead by the time you get here and then I mean you don't get this feeling of what you just don't get the overall phrase so you get stuck um, I mean you can play it very beautifully slowly but for me it's just it right. doesn't show the harmony it's too atomistic in a yeah way. now um, but if a piece has a lot of change, those harmonies like the F minor. You know, it needs more time to speak. I mean, that's one example, but there's so many. Uh, but but the, where the harmonies go uh, make a big difference, I think, to the tempo. Um, yeah, again, I could take many, many different examples. But, and also, you have to see the hardest part in the piece, you know, uh, and take your tempo from there, because there's nothing worse, of course, than slowing down. <laughs> yes, for the hard you part. get to that moment. Yeah, oh, that, oh. that is especially in this F major fugue, which, you know, you might think, oh, I can play this, you know. <laughs> but then, at the end, he has a... Would be ridiculous. So you, <laughs> you know, so you've got it to. So you've got.
got to rein yourself in a little bit at the beginning, although it's still fast enough, let me tell you, for how complicated it is, um, because of that ending. Right. And in terms of just the, the feel of the piece, you know, the, yeah. the kind of expressive uh, yeah. uh, uh, interpretation, how, how do you arrive at that? Oh, after hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of work, you know. There's one quote, I meant to mention that earlier, about box playing. You know, we don't have many sort of things like that in the correspondence or in letters, but there's one, uh, is it Mitzler or somebody, who's, who wrote that when Bach played, he showed movement in every part of his body, you know. I mean, he didn't throw himself about, but you could, but the rhythm was there in, in his body, and I think that's, you know, I love that quote because it, it does sort of relate to the dance. And, um, what was your question? Well, it's Sorry. about how do you get that, that feel, <laughs> how you know, do you the, get the, the, feel? Express, the expressive elements. Well, really, you have, I'm not joking when I say you have to practice and practice and play it, play, play these pieces a lot. You know, it, it takes ages, really, for one fugue to really become a part of you and, and for you to know exactly where it's going. Yeah. Uh, e even when you figured out the notes, then you still have to play it a lot. To, and, and, you know, finally it will sort of fall into place. But And years later, you might see it differently. But um, what, you have to have what I call a road map. You know, you have to know where it's going and where the climax is, which isn't always at the end, or you know, where the points of tension are, where it relaxes, whatever. And to do that, you've got to play it a lot. Right, right. I was also yeah. um, thinking about, uh, the, the, you know, you, you're talking about harmonic rhythms and all that. Yeah. Uh, and in a way, uh, you know, we, do, we don't often think of Bach as rhythmic, you know, when you talk about dance. You know, we always think of Bach, Bach as contrapuntal and sort of getting all these clever yeah, but the things rhythms, and actions. But yeah. actually, it's all about these extraordinary cycles he's able to, to kind of um, yeah. draw, as it were, uh, at, at, at sort of different sort of speeds. Uh, and yeah. it's, it's like his universe, you know, his cosmology, yes, where things sure. are moving the, in that kind the of way. Dance is, uh, yeah. As T.S. Eliot talked about, no, yeah. being the center. But, but yeah, it, it, you know, it, let me just say w one thing. He's never stupid in how he contrasts his subjects with the counter subject. And that's one thing that a lot of, uh, well, not just piano students, a lot of professionals don't do either, which I think is important. In this famous fugue, the C minor. <laughs> For me, the important thing is the musical line there, which goes down. No? So that's why I articulate those notes to land on that. And that, that is, you know, all this articulation you choose is related to string bowings. Uh, you should play them the way a string player, a good string player, would play them. Okay, so we get through that. <laughs> we have the subject up here in the in the top voice, and now this is the counter subject. Now a lot of people play that detached as well, but I don't like it because it does it doesn't set off the subject very well. It's too confusing. <laughs> if you have it legato, it's not totally legato because I don't, there's a tiny break there for the interval. But do you hear what I mean? It's much more easy to distinguish those two voices. The problem is, it's fine when you've got two hands to play that, but often you've got to play both with the same hand. So then you, and that's, this is why most people don't do it, because it's too hard. to do the two different articulations for that's the really one hand. <laughs> tricky yeah. yes. and, and that's really actually an easy example of that kind of thing but and then you have, see you've got the left hand smooth too so you've got to do so many different things with the brain at the same time in Bach but yeah but that's why he all you know almost always chooses a counter subject that's very different rhythmically right. and articulation wise because then on the harpsichord which has a more mon monochrome, monochrome sound it would still be distinguishable right right so it's this very complex weave that yeah. you have to somehow get across which yeah. is actually extremely yeah. difficult as a text i mean yeah. literally as a texture i was also th um uh thinking that you know you you're so fortunate to be playing all 
the works, you know, keyboard works of oh, Bach, yeah, because yeah. in a way they reflect back on the Preludes and Fugues, oh, because sure. you know they don't, it doesn't tell you it's a gig or whatever, no, right? No, no. But if you've been playing, you know, yeah. the French suites or the English suites, then you yeah. get a sense in which you know actually this sits within this yeah, kind of yeah. genre. Well, that's why when I recorded these for the first time. I had already recorded all the French suites and partitas and played several English suites, but I was really happy I'd, I had done that because I learned so much about the dancers doing all the partitas, and then I felt more ready to do all of this. And having then done all of this, I felt, and, and the complete works of Bach, because I, 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 let, I left the art of fugue for the very end, in fact, 10 years later or something, not quite 10 years later, no. But anyway, I left it for after I had done otherwise the complete works of Bach. And I was really glad for that because everything I had learned uh, made me realize how to interpret the art of fugue, which I don't think I would have had a clue had I started it without doing the rest. Uh, it's interesting you did two recordings. Yeah. Uh, why did you do two recordings? Well, because when I was here 10 years ago, maybe some of you will remember, maybe not. I, actually, I played at the Cultural Center in 2007, eight was my Bach World Tour when I played the complete well to clavier from memory around the world 110 times in 26 countries on six continents. And um, uh, so, uh, and for that tour, my record company, Hyperion, was re-releasing my recording in a special box, you know. And, and I was listening to it one day and I thought, oh, I can play that much better now. So I phoned up my record company. I said, look, can I not re-record it? You want to re-record it? Why do we already got this recorded? I said, please, please. Anyway, so after I had done the tour, um, I went into the studio, well, a church, a beautiful church in Berlin, and in five days recorded the whole Well Tempered Clavier um, because I had played it so much, I really knew it. So we, we did it in a very short time. And, um, and that was the second recording, so in 2008. And um, now I even do some things differently 10 years later, but still, that recording, I'm still extremely happy with it. Uh, it hasn't changed massively since then. But um, yeah, as I said, it, there's more flexibility. And it's, it's, it's a real live performance, that recording. So it's interesting to me because, in a way, you know, living with Bach and you know, th throughout your life, in mm. a way, uh, you have different experiences of the same piece yeah. and different readings, I suppose, of them. Yeah. So are there pieces in the two books where you radically changed? Uh, maybe not in the two recordings, but in the way you first understood it and then now? Uh, radically changed? I don't, I don't think, um, you know, not in pieces that I had already sort of learned and performed, but there were radical changes in the process of learning, as I said, with that one that I started slow and I thought, you know, this isn't working. And also I do remember, you know, quite early on in my, in my years of doing Bach, looking at some of those ones in book two and not even having a clue how they would be played like this. <laughs> Now it seems quite normal to me looking at what on the on the page what what to do. But then I had you know. It but was why just, did you have no idea what to do? I was just curious. Well, I see you know you you just seem uh, I don't know. I just uh, wasn't in the spirit of right. it, or I, you don't get such a good idea from just playing the subject there. But it right. it looked incredibly complicated and. But you know, when you when you do the keyboard works, it's important also to listen to the cantatas, to listen to the you know the orchestral works, the organ works. Uh, really have a wide experience with total Bach. Yeah, my goodness, oh. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very demanding. But then then you can bring all that experience as a way yeah. into each performance in exactly. a way. It, it particularizes yeah. an experience. I would say now performing it because I've. Um, in this Bach Odyssey that I'm doing now, playing the complete works, uh, this year, 2018, has been the year for both books of the Well Tempered Clavier and the Goldberg. And so um, in January, I, I started with book one only. It was supposed to be that I would do one concert in the one program in the in the spring, one in sort of the summer, and one in the fall. It didn't work out like that because already in June I was playing both books of the Well Tempered. I worked like mad. I think I got up book one basically in about twelve days because that's all the time I really had. I couldn't have done that with book two because it's so much more complicated. That took me about a month and a half or two months more. more. But um, 
But it was great to have the experience of playing again. And the other day, I was last week, I was playing this all in Amsterdam, and I was thinking, you know, sorry, I'm going to use a bad word here. I said, there's no bullshit in this music <laughs> at all. <laughs> there's just... You know, it's just the most pure, it's very abstract music, but there's not one note that's superfluous or you get a very, um, I don't know, it's a very special thing to play it. I can't put it into words. Well, in, in that sense, it's ex extremely demanding. I mean, yeah. you know, the, there's no room to fudge no, anything, no, right? No, you can't hide. There's no, no room you, to hide. There's no room to hide, no which is the scariest thing. It is. In a way. So we're very grateful <laughs> <laughs> that you're willing to do this. Yeah. Uh, are there, I mean, I don't know whether I should ask this question, but I mean, do you have favorite, you know, producing fugues in this that you, you just like, ah, oh, yes, this is Oh, this yeah. Is well, that's that great C sharp minor one. And also because I learned it so young, too, but you'll hear it. It's a hugely emotional piece. Uh, what is this? This is book one. Boof. It is hard because, well, this, the E flat minor, this one, mm -hmm. which you'll notice I do without pedal. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other lecture. <laughs> and the fugue, very vocal fugue. Yeah, it's a wonderful few. Uh, the, yeah, those. Oh, I love the A flat major though too. But this one eh? and the few. I love the very vocal fugues. I think um, because I sang also in my father's choir. You know, right. at church. I had that experience very early on, and so um, I really love those ones. Uh, there's the great A minor fugue in book one, which goes on for six pages, and the subject is very long, this one. And this I, I shouldn't actually say, but I call it my baby hippopotamus fugue because there was a musicologist, you know, called Ebenezer Prout. Yes, who put, Prout, a long time ago. <laughs> a long time ago, who put words to all the fugue subjects, and his words to this one were... I don't want to know the words to all the subjects, but on a little isle in the river, night early one Sunday morning, a baby hippopotamus sat eating bread and jam. On a little isle in the river. <laughs> but it's wonderful how the words mirror the articulation, no? <laughs> right. Anyway, sometimes I sing it along just to get me through the six pages of this fugue. So remember the hippopotamus. Uh, that's a hippopotamus <laughs> one, which will bring a smile to. Yeah, those are some highlights in, right. in book one. But so is it, are there fugues that you should sort of, or, or preludes that you should highlight for the audience of like, this might be a bit weird, or this is really there something are some that, you know... There are of the preludes, yeah, especially in book two. I mean, we have this one, the A minor, which is really quite mathematical and very abstract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on he goes, and then, of course, it, he turns it upside down in the second half. Chromaticism, yeah, it's very modern, no? Um, preludes, oh my God. Uh, oh, there's some, especially in book two, there, there are some great ones, because in book one, they're much shorter and sort of warming up, you know, or little improvisations often on, based on broken chords. Yeah, that's book one. Uh, but in book two, they're real pieces. They can be quite substantial. Yeah, the F sharp major. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just three pages long, which is, uh, oh, the F sharp minor, which is gorgeous, this beautiful lyrical. So I'm wonderful area there. So yeah. 
many, many, many amazing many, things happening many in those previews. Things, yeah. You know, they, they, people often say, I think you've probably said it probably yourself, um, that bark is good for you. I mean, there's something about bark that uh, is good for your soul, you know, yeah, uh, or sure. is, is character forming in, in, in some sense. I mean, do you, do you believe yes, that? Yes, I and do. Of, as a person that's obviously lived with <laughs> playing yeah, this music for no, so long. I do. I think it does give you, it's wonderful food for the soul, for, for the emotions, for satisfaction, for developing your mind, your intelligence. Yeah, and I get, it's funny, I get more letters from people around the world, you know, through my website, Facebook, whatever, about Bach than anything else, just the comfort that it brings them, that it's music that they've listened to when a loved one has died, when a baby has been born, when they've lost their job, or, you know, it, it um, seems to really bring a lot of comfort to people, um, more so than any other music, I would say. Can you kind of put your finger on why that is the case? Or it's just one That's of these so nebulous hard. things? Uh, maybe, I don't know <laughs> if we should put our finger on no, leave it. Leave it ineffable. But I think, I think it is because, you know, although it every piece tells a story, it's not telling an exact story. So you can put your own stories to it. You know, it, it is abstract in that way. And just the sheer beauty of it. Okay. You know. I'm reminded actually of, of one of your stories now because of your own resilience, really. Okay. Because I think when you, when you were doing this uh, this tour yeah. and you first started playing these two books again, yeah. um, you broke your leg, is that right? I broke my foot. You broke your foot. My left yeah. foot. And I, I got up that and I was in Oxford January 24th and I fell down some steps in this church that I simply didn't see an hour before the concert. I was in terrible pain and I couldn't walk, so... I didn't want to cancel. I never liked to cancel, you know, unless I can't get out of bed. Well, they had to carry me on stage because I couldn't put any weight on the foot. They carried me on stage and, and I, uh, you know, hopped on the bench and, and I played all of book one, yeah, for the first time in 10 years. <laughs> I had telling the audience that if the pain got to be too much, I'd have to stop, but I played it all. And uh, I played it two nights later in the famous Wigmore Hall in London where they had to bring me on in a wheelchair because they still hadn't diagnosed that it was broken. And anyway, I did. And then I went around the world for th three months with crutches and wheelchairs and airports and playing all sorts of stuff. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was an ex a lesson Well, in that's life. the bark in you coming that's out. A, that's that's, the, the, that's <laughs> that discipline, right? <laughs> that's the, discipline. <laughs> the show was kind of, we got to play this. That's right. <laughs> and it was your solace easily, as well. <laughs> it was. I don't easily give up. That's true. It's just amazing that true. you would do that. I mean, really, I think a lot of people would have just said, oh, a lot of people would have, I'm injured. Yeah. I cannot perform, no, right? No, 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 I, for sure. I think 99% of people. So you had to play with your leg kind of well, dangling. Well, I had it here. and. and and I was turning pages because I had the iPad flat with um, the box, you know, on the floor, but I, which fortunately goes with just the tiniest tap. But there would be the odd occasion where, you know, I was really getting into it, whatever, and just without thinking, I'd put my foot just lightly on the floor or to sit like this. Ah, oh, the pain was just awful. And then, of course, I, I, there are times when I use the middle pedal, you know, um, to hold the bass notes it's in a, at the end of some of the fugues, and I couldn't do that with my left foot. There was absolutely no way. And, and so, but if I, I thought, well, if I use my right foot, that means I can't use the sustaining pedal at all. But thank goodness I do have a good legato because I opted to use, you know, the right foot to hold these notes and then just played everything that, without the pedal otherwise because I really don't use much pedal, but... Yeah, so but I managed. It, it, your performance is really a testimony <laughs> of the goodness of Bach for the soul, right? Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> just very way. careful about steps. Yeah. But All right. you've been amazing. Whoa, Thank you for sharing so much about Bach. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. We're so grateful.